Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Reimagine 2021, the virtual blockchain conference series. I'm your co-host, Ashley Meredith from Mousebelt, and today we're bringing you a very special edition of our series. It's our 10th anniversary event. Uh, we've been doing this for a little over a year now, almost every month, and, and we've been able to do this 10 times, and we're just so grateful for the following that we have accrued over that time and uh, that all of you are tuning in. And today I am pleased to introduce our next guest. It's Doug Leonard, the CEO of Hi-Fi Finance. Welcome, Doug. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Ashley. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Doug is one of our repeat guests, a friend of the pod or the show, as you might say, uh, in the Four or More Club. Uh, so thank you so much for coming back on. Anyone who wants to check out some of his other interviews, head on over to our Reimagine 2020 YouTube channel, smash that subscribe button and check out all of the awesome uh, interviews that we have there and, and Doug's past interviews. So on this version of the show, I'd like to kind of ask you my favorite question to ask guests. Uh, we sure. have a robust university program at Mousebelt. We connect with students at over 100 universities in 24 countries, pointing them towards educational resources and especially our startup school and just trying to provide advice and education to students and startup founders. Uh, I'd like you to tell us a bit about your career change into blockchain. What were you doing before? How did you make that change? And do you have any advice for students or entrepreneurs looking to do the same? Sure. A lot to unpack there. So I got into blockchain uh, mostly because it was a passion I was pursuing in my free time, something that I was you know, very uh, opinionated about. I shared a lot of my thoughts and feelings with family members. Uh, you know, I was a typical guy. You got to get together at Thanksgiving dinner, and I just wanted to spew out about Bitcoin and how it was the future and all this stuff. Uh, and... Uh, even to the point where I think amongst my group of friends, uh, as soon as someone said Bitcoin at a gathering, they'd be like, oh, here we go again. They would all just roll their eyes. And so I, you know, it was during my last few years at university that I got into Bitcoin or first came, uh, you know, exposed to it and, and started to be intrigued by it. Uh, and, and so that, that interest would grow and grow. Um, and I wanted to take things from more of just a, a speculation on the future and turn it into something that I did every day. Uh, so, so at the time, I was a mobile developer and I had been working uh, for some various telecom companies here in Utah, where I live. Um, and so uh, after talking a big talk to my wife one day, saying that I believe that blockchain is going to change the world to the same order of magnitude that the internet has. She said, well, if you really believe that, then why aren't you working in blockchain? And uh, so she pushed me into it. And, and I'm really grateful for that because uh, it has led our family down a unique path um, to, to, you know, essentially we, we looked at every blockchain company that Utah had to offer us. And because my network was here, I didn't want to leave the state of Utah yet. And uh, we ended up finding uh, two finalists. There was a company called Medici Ventures, and then there was uh, uh, Mainframe. And so having uh, ran into the CTO at the time, Carl, at a uh, blockchain conference uh, here in Utah, I followed up with him and ended up deciding because I had worked my career in startups that I wanted something that was more of a startup field, less of a corporate field. And so mainframe would be a good fit for me. And, and ultimately that is me just following uh, my passion, uh, my wife being sick of me talking a big talk uh, and pushing me into this. And so that, that's what uh, got me into blockchain full time and uh, transitioned from just a speculation uh, and a hobby to uh, you know, what I do on a day to day. That's excellent. It's so great to hear that your wife was so supportive. And I think that speaks to the importance of one, uh, talking about your passions and sharing mm -hmm. them with the people that you care about and having supportive people in your corner. So uh, good, good advice for any entrepreneur or, or someone looking to uh, change their career. 
um, put your attention there, right? What, whatever your intention is, put your attention there. Uh, right. Talk about it with other people. You never know what can happen when you start uh, focusing your attention on your pa- things that you're passionate about and that it's so important to have uh, passionate people and uh, supportive people around you. Um, so wonderful. Uh, I also think that it's great storytelling or advice for entrepreneurs to think about how people built their business and and when they might pivot. So people who go to our YouTube channel to check out your other interviews might notice mm-hmm. that uh, uh, you used to work at Mainframe and now it's called Hi-Fi Finance. Can you tell yeah. us about that? Sure. So so there's been a big uh, a rebranding and total pivot of the entire business unit. So I, I guess I'll give a little bit more of a context around. So I originally joined Mainframe as an engineer and I uh, quickly gravitated towards uh, strategy. And um, as somebody who really used the technology, I had opinions and uh, the leadership uh, at, at least put up with those opinions. And, um, and, and we agreed a, a lot. Um, and so I, I would end up feeling that mainframe had um, what wasn't going to really be the success I had hoped it would be when I joined. And I remember a conversation I ended up having with Mick, the CEO at the time. And I said, you know, Mick, uh, and at the time mainframe was building a decentralized chat application. And, and I, I had, you know, I had joined right as we were entering into a bear market. And so sort of uh, very similar to what we're experiencing today, where we had these huge all-time highs, and then we kind of have a little bit of a sell-off going on. And and what I had concluded was that most of the people who had, uh, you know, that were part of our audience had had joined for the speculation and, and hadn't necessarily wanted to change the world of chat and communication and, and, and I had a background, you know, having worked for some of these local telecom companies of, you know, building chat applications, uh, you know, from a mobile perspective. And, uh, and, and so I felt like I was a good fit for that. But as soon as like, it, it felt like people were calling us a scam because the token price was going down, yet the fundamental project was only making more and more progress towards the vision that we had uh, sold everybody on. Um, and, and that gets old after a while and it does wear on, you know, the, the team internally. And so I, I ended up having a conversation with Mick where I said, look, man, I, I think, you know, mainframe, uh, you know, doesn't offer me what it it once did. And, uh, for that reason, I think I'm going to bow out. And, and he said, Hey, you should probably talk to your wife, you know, and, you know, don't, you know, go making a rash decision. And so I went home and I talked to my wife and, and she said, uh, she said, you know, I don't, she said she'd support me in whatever I decided. Uh, She liked the blockchain stuff and she saw how engaged I was with it. And, um, and, 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 but dealing with a community that didn't believe in what you were building uh, it's hard to go to work every day and believe that what you're going to do is a huge success. And so we, we took a look around and, and I in particular took a look around and uh, said, like, I don't think people are interested in chat. The, the real utility in the space is in DeFi. Uh, this is what people are using. And I had just, uh, I had used MakerDAO to borrow against my Ethereum to purchase uh, my minivan for our family. And so, so we'd had that real life experience uh, firsthand. And and I said, look, here's some real utility. And so let's see if we can't take the existing uh, technology. And this wasn't just my idea, you know, Mick and uh, others on the team, uh, you know, collectively, we came to this idea of like, you know, let's see if we can't take uh, the existing technology that we've built for CHAP and take the decentralized backbone and offer it to other decentralized applications. And we could, you know, we, we would call it mainframe OS and we could take that and then, uh, you know, essentially be an app store for, you know, decentralized apps and we could vet them and they could have a high reputation score and uh, we, we could pivot into that. So, so we would pivot into that and, uh, but it still just wasn't getting the traction 
that that we had hoped. So I, I, I said, you know, I'll, I'll step away and, and I would go and start another business. And uh, I wouldn't really follow mainframe, but, you know, sort of in the peripheral um, when when I would come back, at, you know, to meet for Mick one day and, and we were discussing another business matter and he he would drop it on me. He said, Doug, uh, I think we'd like you to come and uh, run mainframe. He says, you know, you've seen us go from the chat application to mainframe OS. And he says, you know, I've, I, you know, tended, you know, we, we both saw eye to eye that DeFi was where the whole space was heading. And that's where real utility could be had. And we felt this uh, incredible responsibility with our token and giving our very best effort in driving value back to that token. And of course, our incentives were aligned with that. Um, and he said, I think, you know, you were the guy who really used this technology. And I think you're the guy who we want leading this going forward. And so he stepped down and, and he would put me in charge. And I, I gave him one condition that was that I wanted full autonomy. I didn't want to be a puppet for somebody else. I didn't want to be, uh, you know, I would, I would need to make my own mistakes and I would need my own room to grow. Uh, and to his credit, he's now chairman of the board. Uh, he's done exactly that. They have, you know, Mick has gone off and built a, um, a, a complementary product called Genesis Block and is helping onboard new users into the crypto space and give them access to DeFi type yields through a, uh, an app on your phone. Whereas our focus here at HiFi was one to, to take, you know, Mick had already released an early version of a white paper that talked about fixed rate lending that was built uh, as, a, as a derivative of Dan Robinson's work uh, where he had published the yield space white paper. And, and so uh, we, we had taken this uh, model and, and I came back and I reworked it a little bit. And then we kind of announced that we would be going into DeFi, we would be acquiring Sablier and that we would, um, and then we would be uh, rebranding into the Hi-Fi brand. That really got everybody's attention. And I think reinvigorated both our uh, community who, who got excited that there could be some new utility for our token. Um, and I think everyone was feeling the same thing in that, um, you know, having a decentralized operating system, nobody really cared in the same way that they didn't care about decentralized chat. It's not... Uh, life and death. It's not something that, you know, you wake up today and you just can't live without decentralized chat or decentralized operating system. But I think it, it inherently, when you think of like uh, our, our hierarchy of needs, everybody needs to prepare for tomorrow and needs tools that can help them hedge against uh, different aspects or uh, reach different goals that they have. And so decentralized finance is, you know, a, a transparent take on an existing system that serves a very narrow set of people. I think in America, we have an uh, incredible amount of privilege in our access to a stable or, or at least relatively stable economy um, that, that's backed by, you know, certain socioeconomic powers. And uh, what decentralized finance does is it levels the playing ground for anybody who has a internet uh, access to the internet and a willingness to learn. And I think maybe there's a little bit of a, uh, a requirement to understand English since most of DeFi in particular is uh, Westernized right now. Uh, Interesting. And, and so, so you've seen the, the early successes with Compound and Aave, MakerDAO. Uh, these guys have pioneered the entire space and uh, w the whole space is segmented by uh, product types. And so you see Aave with their variable rate lending compound, you know, competing on the same mark, uh, MakerDAO, stablecoin. And then, you know, our, our distinguishing factors, we would like to play in the fixed rate lending space, which is as a massive, massive opportunity because most of the debt in the world is fixed rate debt. It's parked behind fixed rate instruments. And so, uh, I, I think the variable rate nature of existing lending protocols is lend itself to a, a hyper uh, re reflexive uh, environment in which uh, whenever we have these huge run-ups in price and speculation is ballooning, 
everyone gets excited because their interest rates are also ballooning and, and people are earning 20, 30% APY. But, uh, you know, th those things come down, you know, I, I think uh, the last couple of days, you know, we're down below 5% on stablecoin interest rates across most, most lending platforms uh, if, if you negate any sort of incentives on there. Uh, and so we, we want, uh, you know, our, our, our thesis is that if, if, this is go if the world is going to transition to more transparent and decentralized systems, we need tools that can help us uh, lock in predictability. And, and so, so our system will be one of many tools that allows you uh, to lock in a rate and, uh, and have it guaranteed for some specified set of time. And, and we're, we're talking about years here. We would like them to be a year, two years and on. Um, and, and that's gonna take some time to bootstrap it and, and get going. So uh, at, at this point, I, I think that, um, we, you know, with, with Mick, his, his, his whole desire, and I sat with him in, in you know, the executive meetings, both as, uh, you know, somebody who was trying to help steer strategy at mainframe, and, and then, uh, and still to today, as we talk high level for strategies for both of our companies, uh, his goal has been to drive utility to our token and, and to follow what the customer wants. As soon as we realized that people were not interested in our decentralized chat and decentralized operating system, uh, the nice thing about crypto uh, users is in inherently your participation with DAOs or other organizations uh, is financial in nature. And people aren't quiet when they're losing money. And people aren't yeah. quiet when they don't believe in your future. And so... Uh, the, the, the whole world, you know, it felt like was screaming at us that you needed to change, you needed to do something. And so it, it made it easy because we all agreed we didn't want to be what we were today. And, and so it, it's been a longer process because we, you know, a couple, a couple of things that we, we learned al along the way is that just because you can sell people on the idea doesn't mean it's a good idea. You know, that people may have ulterior motives, you know, token price go up and they don't really care what's in your white paper. Uh, whereas, you know, we poured our heart and soul into these white papers and, and ultimately would abandon them. And so we had to change the way that we approach things uh, as this is kind of now our third attempt at product market fit. Um, and, and I see, you know, you compare us to other communities. Um, I felt like my number one job as CEO was I needed to sell confidence to our community. Like, why believe in us for a third time? If we've done you wrong twice, what what makes this time around different? And, and, and that was kind of the logic behind uh, basically rebuilding our team from the ground up. There's very little overlap to the team that it was uh, when I was an engineer to the team that it is today. And, and that was by design. Uh, we wanted to bring on members to our team who had either worked in the existing financial sector before, and so they have a perspective of how those industries work, or have built and shipped DeFi products. And so every engineer on the team meets at, at least one of those two criteria. And, and so we acquired Sablier, which was an aqua hire of Paul, our uh, lead engineer. And then we went after other individuals that had experiences integrating with DeFi protocols or building them themselves. Um, and, and so uh, our hope is to, to sell everyone on uh, confidence in our future because, uh, I don't think we can uh, pivot too many more times. There's really not an option. It's a, it's a do or die for us. But because of the excitement and because of the natural cycles we've seen in crypto, uh, mainframe has been able to perpetuate itself through, you know, just maybe getting lucky, but also in my mind, I've made very logical investments with the treasury and uh, been able to cash out at, at good times to where, uh, we've got more runway for our team that has grown significantly today than when I took over, you know, 18 months ago. So our, uh, you know, if you just look at probabilities, the probability of our ability to execute on our, our current vision uh, is we have a higher probability of success today, you know, objectively just looking at the numbers on paper. So, uh, so when, when I look at this, um, 
I, I think any advice to other entrepreneurs or early startups, uh, it feels like mainframe is early, but we've been doing this for, you know, for almost five years, um, trying to break into the, the blockchain space and do something useful. It's not been a pretty journey. Um, but, but the nice thing is we have been educated along the way and most things that we do today are very, very intentional. Uh, one example of that is being very explicit about where we want to experiment. Right now is an excellent time to experiment within the space of broadly of DeFi. And, and so we've chosen to try and experiment uh, specifically around the concept of collateralization of assets and what can be considered collateral. Now, we haven't done anything material about it today, or mostly uh, we just talk about it uh, because we, we need to ship uh, the next version of our product before we start shipping exotic collateral types and trying to do experiments that are you know, in, in walled gardens so that they can be safe and they can fail in a safe manner uh, if they fail. Um, and, and so we, we talk a lot about it now, but uh, you know, this is a place that we've really been explicit about where we spend a lot of time in thinking. And a place that we're not interested in experimenting is our token economics is we don't really want to toy and uh, risk something that uh, might have a you know, marginal benefit, but has a, a larger barrier for people to understand it. And so when, when we publish our updated token economics, it is basically we've taken the best, most successful concepts from other DeFi protocols like Aave, Synthetics, Uniswap, and MakerDAO, and, and tried to put them together in a nice cohesive way to work together as we work to rebootstrap our total token economy and community around our fixed rate lending protocol. Awesome. That's all such great, uh, you know, real world example for entrepreneurs joining the blockchain space that uh, it can take four or five years or three different pivots to find product market fit and um, the importance the importance of listening to customers and of uh, doing things in the blockchain space that aren't speculation, that are about things that people actually need and actually are going to use. And I think you know we get really excited about the promise and power of blockchain and and we're gonna put, you know, royalties are going to be controlled by NFTs and, uh, you know, we're going to have, you know, private messaging chat on the blockchain. Um, it might be a little early for some of that. Very um, early. Very <laughs> early. But we, before we get there, why don't we uh, solidify what blockchain does the best, which is finance, right? It was built, uh, Bitcoin, you know, blockchain does money really, really well. Well, I disagree there. Blockchain does trust really well. It's one of the most inefficient database schemas we could possibly create. But the thing with money, though, is the there is a disproportionately high cost of trust when dealing in financial matters. And so it is, and this is my thesis on Bitcoin, is that it is sufficiently distinct from other types of value that it will remain relevant and interesting for, for the future. Um, but, but blockchain itself is, is very inefficient uh, and there are a lot better ways to do things. But when you, when you want a system that uh, you know, can penetrate language barriers, uh, barriers of countries, um, then this is one of the only possible solutions that exists. And so in, in that way, uh, when it's all you got, it's very cool, unique, and definitely the future. Um, and it's also something that the existing system does not know yet how to manage decentralized organizations or a leaderless organization like Bitcoin. And thus, it is able to sort of revisit um, ideas within finance that the uh, non-decentralized portions of it uh, can't, can't visit again because either the, the laws and the regulations are, are already set in stone, um, but it's, you can see a, 
a very experimental space where people are trying new things each week. Uh, but that's also one of the reasons that uh, it's hard for people to approach is because with these experiments and the high rate of experimentation comes a high rate of failure. Um, and it also attracts, uh, you know, a, a, to a disproportionate degree, uh, scammers. And uh, as we've lowered the barrier to entry for creating tokens and to trying novel ideas, uh, it is easy to take advantage of people because there is information asymmetry between speculators and those who are building. And, and even though it is a public ledger, uh, it is difficult to comprehend all of the possible outputs of a system when there's a frenzy of activity and minutes can cost you thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so uh, you get irrational exuberance and uh, you get uh, something that is quite entertaining to watch, but can be very real and hurt uh, people if they overextend themselves. Absolutely. Well, I think another part of your commitment to, you know, building products that make a difference for people and isn't just about speculation is this uh, fixed rate lending versus variable rate lending. Can you explain for viewers who might not understand those concepts, uh, what exactly that is and, and what makes HiFi different from competitors and, and, and how your uh, product actually works. Sure. So, so first I'll, I'll correct something. You, you mentioned something there, how it's not just for speculation. Um, this, is, this is incorrect. Uh, a HiFi is almost explicitly for speculation. And in fact, it, is, uh, it, it puts guardrails around your speculation to give you more predictable speculation. When you look at the financial markets, a lot of people who don't understand them uh, tend to um, uh, broad, you know, in broad strokes paint, you know, the stock market is just you know, a, a casino. You, you, you're just playing, but, but whenever you have either some domain experience or are working towards certain goals, uh, you know, the stock market is one of the most efficient ways that we have uh, to extend opportunity, you know, to certain groups of people within geography. So, you know, you know, the U.S. stock market is typically limited to U.S. investors and you can invest, but there's, you've got to jump through some hoops if you want to come in from outside. And, and so the, the stock market is not just gambling, um, but you are speculating, you know, you might be making a bet on Apple or a, a, an index of, of assets. And so with, with HiFi, we have a, a native solution, a crypto native solution for uh, using assets that have liquid value um, as collateral. And it allows you to either create leverage or potentially hedge yourself out against certain, uh, certain market events. So you might choose to short the market. Um, uh, for example, let me jump back to my minivan story. Whenever I, you know, pulled out uh, or, or uh, printed myself debt using MakerDAO, uh, one of my concerns was actually that Ethereum would tank in value as I, um, I believed in Ethereum long-term, but I, I, I felt like hey, maybe if it suddenly goes down, I don't wanna lose this stack of Ethereum. So what I did is I ended up taking a small leveraged bet so that in the event that there was a sudden uh, downturn in price, I would be covered. And it cost me a little bit of money to buy that highly leveraged, uh, you know, narrowly scoped um, option. But in doing so, I could sleep at night and not have to wake up in the middle of the night and check the price of Ethereum because, uh, you know, some large portion of my net worth was financing a minivan. Um, and, and so really what HiFi does is it allows people to speculate with more assurance in, in the future. Um, so how does it work? So uh, essentially, if, if people wanted, you know, some of these uh, concepts that I use very easily now were, were new to me. And, and so, for example, uh, we have a system that's very similar to a zero coupon bond. And for some people that will mean something and for others it won't, but I'll, I'll try to explain it the best I can. Is that there is a maturity date when your debt comes due or 
on, on the other side of the market, there's a maturity date in which you can collect all the interest earned from lending out your money. And so by having a fixed duration for our debt instrument, we are able to guarantee that users will have a known outcome from lending or borrowing. So that's either you know exactly how much you're going to pay or you know exactly how much you're going to make on the lending side. With Compound and Aave and MakerDAO, uh, these are all uh, leveraged instruments, uh, you have no guarantees. And in fact, if the thing that you have a high conviction on, say Ethereum, uh, this happened with my minivan example, is w whenever things start turning bullish, people start to leverage themselves up. And so what will happen mm -hmm. in the debt markets is that the interest rates and the amount that people are willing to pay in order to borrow against their assets increases drastically. So in a matter of three weeks, when I was borrowing against my minivan, we saw a 70% appreciation in Ethereum's value. And, and so what ended up happening is I started the month with, a, uh, with an interest rate, you know, I think it was below two or 3%, very manageable. Mm -hmm. And it was competitive with what I could get at the banks. I ended that three week period with an interest rate that was greater than 15%. Wow. It was it's drastic. And if you look at change in percentages of my interest rate, it, it's phenomenal. And so nobody wants to see a, a 100x increase in their interest rate. Uh, if, if, the, if the banks did that to you today, people would be up in arms and uh, making a run on the bank because it, it would be criminal. But we sign up for that in DeFi at least with the existing tools that are mature enough for people to trust and have broad adoption within the space. And so the, the next step is to bring uh, a little bit more sophistication and a little bit more uh, predictability into the tool set that users have. So that if you lock in a 2% loan, that is what you're gonna pay on that loan. And if you lock in, if you're gonna lend at 2%, that's all you're gonna earn. Now, if you're gonna lend at 15%, that's guaranteed to be there at your maturity date. So in short, by having a fixed duration on the, um, on the debt instrument, we're able to guarantee a known outcome in what you're gonna earn or what you're going to pay, depending on the side of the market you're on. Well, that's awesome. Uh... Yeah, and and for us in terms of adoption, like makes a lot more sense to people. It's more similar to how traditional finance works, right? Your bank is not uh, randomly uh, or not randomly, but uh, because of some reason, hundred uh, xing your your interest rate. Right. Well, that's uh, awesome. Great, great uh, developments in the HiFi product. Um, can you tell people where you are in your roadmap right now? Sure. And this, this is a touchy one and where some people think I do a song and a dance because I do. And, and, and it's intentional because there are, when, when you're doing something that has not been done before, uh, you cannot predict the, the outcome. And, and so on our website, we put milestones that we're working towards. So the next major milestone is uh, our version one release, which includes an improvement on the MVP that we put out on mainnet uh, you know, several months ago. The, the major improvement is that we're going to allow uh, multi-collateral uh, support for your uh, leveraged position. So you could deposit your wrapped Bitcoin and your wrapped Ethereum uh, into the same vault and uh, and be able to get credit extended to you against that. Um, so th that's the major innovation that's happening um, it, for our next major update. And then we're also preparing the architecture, making sure it's flexible enough to do things with more exotic types of uh, collateral. Um, most, most interesting to me is uh, LP tokens or uh, just other DeFi farming type strategies that you could come and uh, borrow against. And so, and then in the future, I think you're gonna see us do uh, some very targeted type of, you know, like a DeFi savings account um, and, and some other stuff that, that I, I won't mention. But uh, 
in, in terms of where we're at right now, we're kind of in the hardening phase of our development where uh, most of the code is, is written and we, we now need to go through everything with a fine tooth comb. We're quite particular on making sure we take our time uh, seeing as, you know, it's, it's not a week goes by in DeFi without another DeFi exploit. And so uh, we, we put a lot of uh, time and attention into the details of making, you know, starting with our code legibility uh, and, and then our, you know, reviews that we do internally with the team. Uh, so, uh, you know, without giving us, you know, a specific idea on what I personally believe uh when we're actually going to go live with these things, uh, that, that's the next major milestone that we're working towards. And, and I think that when we do so, we'll be able to do it with a lot of confidence because of the approach that we've taken. Absolutely. Well, excellent. Anyone who wants to learn more about that can head over to hifi.finance, H-I-F-I.finance. Um, so, Talking about community, and uh, I think people who are building stuff in the blockchain space will be interested in this. Um, you've been able to build a community and have them follow you through multiple pivots. And you mentioned that you're kind of focusing on Korea. So just wanted to hear about why that is. We also uh, have built a lot on Icon, which is a Korean blockchain. And I lived there for a couple months. So uh, we see the opportunity there. Um, want to hear your thoughts on it. Sure. So when you look at DeFi broadly and kind of our darling DeFi projects, you have MakerDAO, you have Compound, and, and you've got Aave and Synthetics. Those are kind of like the, the major protocol. And I'll, I'll throw Uniswap in there. Uh, I'd probably be remiss if I didn't. But the one thing that most of them have in common is the people that they've accepted money from are almost all at the VC level, Western VC companies. And, and this is wonderful because you know, it's, it's done them a lot of good. It gave them access to capital. I, I've seen some of the founders talk specifically about you know, um, you know, what, how enabling that money was for them and being able to take the risk that they, they needed to and that VCs expect you to with their money. But the, the trouble is that it ends up also isolating part of the world. Most of these projects uh, you know, only have an English uh, translation. And so if, if you don't speak English, well, you're not going to be able to educate yourself to be there you know, when the getting is good on these protocols. And so, um, I, so, so one of the things that we did early on at Mainframe is that we wanted our token distribution to be very decentralized. And so we actually ended up going all across the world. We did an airdrop tour in Europe, and then we did another airdrop tour in uh, Asia. And along the way, we would host events and educate people about what we were trying to do. And then we would, you know, uh, we would drop tokens uh, and do a literal airdrop of our tokens on people and they would get the balloons and they would have a poker chip in them that could be redeemable at our ICO. This was very fun and exciting and uh, you know, great on the marketing side. What ended up happening is you know, we ended up making connections and building communities in each of these different places that we went across the world and I would argue that likely our token is one of the most distributed in the world. And, and frankly, because we failed and we tried to distribute it early. And so most of the people who bought in as uh, you know, very, very early on have either given up on us, dumped their tokens. And so you ended up, by the time we pivoted into DeFi, you only have people who really believed in us as a team. If you believed in the concept, well, you were wrong. Like, frankly, <laughs> you, you, you're, you're bad, just like us, at predicting what is going to, to make it. But one thing with our team is that we haven't given up. And so making a bet on the team, in my judgment, hasn't been a bad one yet. And so the, uh, if you take a look, as we uh, created these different communities across the world, uh, we started to plant seeds with them. And uh, one of the seeds that flourished the most was actually our Korean community. Uh, we ended up making early connections on with uh, 
you know, Upbit exchange. And we were, you know, listed very early on on Upbit. And 30% of our entire token supply sits on the Upbit exchange. And this is, this is phenomenal. I don't think any other exchange or any other token has this type of profile if you look at them. And so I, I don't believe that I'm any sort of celebrity in Korea. Uh, but I, I do believe that uh, the, the people in the community there uh, care about this and are, make up a large portion of our community. And so we, we have finally decided that we need to reflect who our audience is today. And so as an organization, every major uh, announcement that we make, it does come out slightly slower because we have to wait for the Korean translation to be finished and approved and run by a, a committee of uh, Korean speaking members of our community to make sure that our uh, grammar is, is proper and, uh, you know, for, for the things that we're, we're uh, sharing. And, and, and that way, everyone gets the same opportunity of information at the same time. If you look at us, and, and remember, we have an MVP out, but we are dominating in Korea right now. In terms of DeFi protocols, we are one of the top traded by volume DeFi protocols. And, and that's absolutely nuts. I, 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 I uh, the only thing you can credit is the community in Korea, in South Korea. And, and so, uh, you know, that thriving ecosystem that exists there deserves to be a first class citizen within our, uh, within our protocol. And so uh, everything now gets a Korean translation. And, uh, and, and, and so we continue to invest in that. Uh, I hope to make it out there one day. But uh, at this point, the, the more important thing is that uh, we ship out a product that is usable by them uh, before uh, we, we try and visit at any point. Absolutely. Well, hopefully anyone tuning in can uh, get excited about the that market and the opportunities there, uh, just as we have. And it's such a good idea to, you know, find where your customers are, uh, look outside of the U.S. and really invest in um, hiring those translators and trying to reach different communities. So I hope other people will take that to heart. Um, and you're headquartered in Utah right now, um, but That's you correct. have a remote first team all over the world. Uh, what do you see is going on in blockchain in Utah? So specific to Utah, there are just a handful of companies that do anything related to blockchain. One is Taxbit, which just had a phenomenal Series A raise that was record setting. And it goes to show you how big uh, the reach is of blockchain where people have some serious tax needs. Um, so, so we've got some sort of uh, business to business type companies like Taxbit. You have a couple of research oriented companies uh, that either professors have started, uh, Sovereign comes to mind, and uh, are working on problems in the identity space. And then you have, uh, you know, kind of a portfolio type of companies where you can go and get a job in blockchain, but you're going to hop from project to project of different portfolio companies uh, that these funds have invested in. And then you have the raw uh you know, projects. I think Store J is uh, local to Utah. Um, of course, we're here. And then there's probably a, a handful more. Uh, there isn't necessarily a, you know, BYU does a blockchain summit. Uh, it, it seemed like every year, um, not this past year because of COVID. Um, and then there is a blockchain track at every major startup uh, conference. And so, uh, we're not quite to the point where the community is hosting its own events yet. Um, but I, I expect that, you know, if, if we see continued growth in the space, that's something that will naturally follow as the community flourishes. Because we have such a strong tech presence, uh, lots of the tech entrepreneurs and, and people in the space uh, have some type of you know, they're speculators with, you know, their Coinbase app where they've heard of Dogecoin because of Elon Musk. Um, and so it is not so foreign uh, to the community here 
but I, I don't think, I, I think there's a lot of growth, it's still an opportunity ahead of us. Well, maybe some enterprising or passionate uh, college student tuning in in Utah might uh, want to start a meetup or, or start a blockchain club at their school. So uh, there's a gap there and an opportunity. Uh, before we wrap up the segment, um, this is our 10th event. We've been so lucky to be able to kind of, you know, pivot as well. Uh, you know, we always were a remote first company. So I feel like we did have an advantage of engaging communities virtually before the pandemic, but we were, mm -hmm. you know, uh, heavily investing in student conferences and, and going to these places in person. So uh, we felt a real responsibility to maintain that community and, and do this virtual event. And we're just so lucky that we've been able to do this 10 times. And so as we reach our 10th event, just want to hear some of your forward looking thoughts about what do you see happening in the next year or the next 10 events that we have uh, in the blockchain space? So when I, so broader themes in blockchain, I think we're, we're coming to a point where it can't be ignored. You know, the IRS, the uh, internal revenue uh, service for the United States uh, is asking people on their taxes, have they transacted using some sort of cryptocurrency. So it can't be ignored. Uh, when, I, when I look around, uh, there are more funds that are uh, raising money to go and explicitly invest into blockchain because this is an area of growth. Uh, recently, there was some due diligence that I was a part of and uh, a, a group had reached out to you know, one of the big four accounting firms to you know, quote, ask if DeFi was something that was gonna be uh, around, you know, in the next while or not, or if it was just a fad. And uh, even the big four acknowledged that this isn't going anywhere. Uh, DeFi is here to stay and, and they're, you know, deploying resources accordingly. I think more and more accountants are going to have to uh, deal with the headache of dealing with uh, Uniswap trades or other blockchain type transactions. Um, and, and so really the next you know, year or two is going to be probably a rough and tumble massaging of the existing system uh, with new financial primitives that are being acknowledged and lots of people banging their heads against the wall trying to figure out how can I honestly represent uh, my blockchain dealings in a way uh, that isn't going to create a liability for me in the future if I am to be audited. Um, and yet minimizes the costs so that we can continue to fund the experimentation and innovation that's happening in the space. Um, you see, the, you, you see uh, senators that are piping in and taking hot takes on stable coins or that are uh, wanting to weigh in on things that uh, they, they would do well to uh, you know, study more before trying to really take strong opinions. Um, but yeah, I, th I think regulation is coming. And I think the, the entities that are going to fare the best are entities that have embraced the ethos that, you know, Bitcoin introduced to us, which is transparency, surfacing of public knowledge, um, and, and consensus. And so I think, you know, it's the same, the same thing here. We have to reach consensus with our regulators. We need to transparently surface the types of activities that are happening. And because every interaction in blockchain is financial in nature, there is opportunity that doesn't exist in other industries uh, for either nefarious money laundering um, and, or, or other explicit type of things. But it is much easier to use cash for these nefarious things than it is to, you know, uh, use blockchain and broadcast to the world that these transactions are happening between these different parties. And so I, I think in time, uh, regulators are going to understand to a truth of, of what is happening. Um, and, and I think they, they're incentivized to because uh, there's a lot of innovation to come to any country that is going to embrace uh, the future and find new innovative ways to integrate it into any system in which there is huge asymmetric up or downside from the lack of trust. So voting comes to mind. Of course, financials were already there. Uh, identity protection is a good one. Credit scores. 
Uh, these are all areas that uh, authentication where blockchain can really have an impact for good. Now, is there going to be a token attached to each of these that you can buy today and, and you know, make, make buco bucks on? Uh, I certainly hope not. Uh, I, th I think that uh, if, if you're going to have, uh, you know, sort of uh, the right incentives, you're, you're going to have to figure out other coordination mechanisms beyond tokens and beyond uh, just pure speculation of price go up. And, and so... I, I hope that we will see more in the enterprise and government, uh, you know, uh, opportunities there. And uh, but for us in DeFi, it's going to be one of regulation, and those who are willing to play by the rules are going to fare the best and be able to have a voice at the table in uh, steering that conversation. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Doug, for sharing your thoughts on the blockchain industry. Um, running and and pivoting in a startup and uh, all the exciting updates and uh, community building going on with HiFi. Uh, for anyone just tuning in, you are watching Reimagine 2021 Virtual Blockchain Conference Series. This is our 10th anniversary event and I've been talking to Doug Leonard, CEO of HiFi Finance. Thank you so much for joining us, Doug, and stay tuned for more, everyone. Thank you, Ashley.